a concise statement to the whole story if uh, G was the symmetry of the theory and H was <coughs> the symmetry of a solution so when they were continuous symmetries we saw that we expect uh, g dimension of g mod h the coset space which is defined to be the dimension of g minus dimension of h so many massless excitations okay in uh, condensed matter physics, uh, these are also called gapless. These are called gapless excitations. These are the uh, In other words, uh, if you have particles uh, which you excite, and you find that in the energy momentum thing, you find that you can that there is uh, the if you want to excite some particle, you don't the, you you don't need any to there's no gap. I suppose if there is a gap then you have to give energy more than the gap. So, suppose uh, so when you have when you are in quantum field theory you are in a position to create an annihilate particle. So, the number of particles is not uh, is not constant. So, if you have a massive particle you need to uh, actually generate energy. So, usually particle and antiparticle are created. So, at least the minimum energy you would require to create such an excitation would be 2 m c square where m is the mass of the particle. But suppose the particle is massless, then you can see that there is no gap. So, so the scale in the problem is the mass of the excitation. So, in this, uh, in the example we did was SO2 broken to nothing. To nothing, we saw that uh, the, there was the radial mode which had a mass. So, the radial mode. So, what I have in mind when I am calling it radial is that I think of phi the field uh, there were two, uh, two scalar fields right. I can define a complex scalar field phi which is just phi 1 plus i phi 2 and then I can just write phi as uh, uh, mod phi or if you wish in polar coordinate something like r e power i theta and then this is the direction which would be the uh, massive direction. And we so the uh, if you go back and plug into those equations you would see that uh, the mass square rather of the r field was what we got last time. So, we got something like lambda a square upon 4 is this correct I mean you should look at your notes or 2 huh? 4 lambda a square. So, I know there was a 4 I do not remember, but uh, 2 4 whatever some number times lambda a square ok. So, but I, I really like to think of this as a second derivative r equal to whatever was the uh, r equal to I guess the scale in this is a itself at r equal to a. So, that is what it would be ok. And so, for instance, so if you want to see this excitation there in quantum field theory you would say that there is a gap and the gap is roughly of the order of magnitude it is lambda a square. Okay, so, this is the difference between uh, gapless excitations and gap. So, if you are uh, in particular if lambda a square is very very large then those excitations would never uh, compared to the energy scales of your problem you would not look at those excitations you would only look at things like this. Okay, so, this terminology uh, difference between fields. So, uh, particle physics people will say massless excitations and uh, uh, condensed matter people would say gapless they are really the same thing. And uh, there was a question after class uh, or towards the end of last lecture which said you know I was very clever in choosing a parameterization I, I, I wrote something like this I wrote let us write we started out with something like 0 a and then I said I will write eta and uh, I wrote e power i theta. So, we worked out as eta and theta were uh, I mean these things and 
the claim was that this. So, this theta will map to exactly this theta you can check and r will become just a plus eta in this setup. Okay. And uh, yeah, so, so the, the thing is is there a clever way of parameterizing it? The answer is yes and in general you could. So, h is a, is a symmetry of the solution. So, what you would do is, uh, so you you are given h which is a subgroup of g and we will assume that they are all Lie groups. So, in the fact that everything can be written as exponential of something. So, what you would do really is all elements of h. So, a typical group element you would write h as some e power, uh, we will see something it can be written something like this thetas a's and t a's. So, a's would be as many as uh, as many as the dimension of h that means that many parameters. So, if it were so 3 it would be 3 parameters and some sort of generators we will see that we can write it in such a form okay. and the remaining stuff you could write in again in a, this thing, but the key point here is that you can see that uh, uh, I am not working to, uh, to for lowest order in theta or anything is true to all orders in theta. If you write it in this clever fashion you can see it that it is true to all orders in theta or you just look at it in a global way again you would see that uh, this this is true to all orders it is not just saying that the the mass uh, the quadratic term is 0 it is saying that all terms there is no potential. Okay. And uh, so, so there is so in other words I just want you to remember that there exists clever or <laughs> okay, let us leave it at that parameterizations okay, that uh, show explicitly show masslessness to all orders. So, but uh, so we have been discussing uh, classical field theories, but you can ask what happens in quantum field theory and there is something important which comes. Okay. So, what happens? I know this is not a QFT course, but uh, nevertheless the result is something which you, you can remember. Okay. And uh, so, first thing is we uh, so uh, by that I mean what happens to Goldstone's theorem and we will see that there is a dimensionality dependence in the story. Okay. And so, first uh, so the first point to remember so is uh, I keep using classical vacuum solutions, but the analog of that in quantum mechanics or quantum field theory is a classical vacuum. Is there a question? So, vacuum is the ground state, what we will call the ground state and usually you use a symbol something like this. Okay. So, that is the first point. The second thing is to ask uh, can there be uh, what happens to spontaneous symmetry breaking or the or Goldstone's theorem. So, uh, first let us consider discrete symmetries. in quantum mechanics this is something which you, if you have done a course in quantum mechanics you will know about. So, for instance suppose you have a simple potential in quantum mechanics again a double well kind of thing okay. uh, and say minus a sorry plus a and minus a and let us say this is a z 2 symmetry which is takes x goes to minus x. So, the potential has a symmetry in the theory etcetera, but uh, the thing is so and let us say let us call this generator H. So, the question is is H equal 0 not equal to 0. Okay. So, this would be the analogous state and right now I am just getting to the point of stating what I mean. So, by this so only then we would say the symmetry is broken. If h acting on the this thing is 0 that means it is the symmetry is it is a symmetry of the theory. Okay. So, this is just a statement 
uh, that it is. So, naively you would think yeah, the first I mean one, uh, first guess is yes, uh, I mean uh, equal to 0. Okay. So, in terms of the wave function, it is a wave function symmetric is if you if you want to think of that you say psi ground state of x is it equal to up to some phases it might I mean I will permit phases that is not so. So, is this so x goes to minus x uh, this is what I mean. Okay. So, h is a generator. So, yeah this is not correct. So, I should write something like this. Um, so, h now it is I think it makes sense. Okay. Ah. Why, uh, why should it be 0? Yeah, tell me. Yeah, so it should map. So, so all I am saying is h maps the 0 vector to 0. No, I mean it is it is not 0. 0 is different from the vacuum. Okay. So, so what it could have done is it could have it could have done the following thing it could have taken h of 0 could go to say some other state okay and then h of 1 could be equal to 0 here is okay so if it's a symmetry of the thing it would uh, uh, it will take it to itself no 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 that's what I, yeah it is proportional is what i wrote that's what i'm saying no 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 it should give the vacuum you, you do the following thing I operate on a so a h is a discrete symmetry a square is identity okay so a, a trivial way to check i mean to uh, to sort out my error for instance is to act on with h square so you, if i did it this way okay so the proportionality i put here is because that it could be minus of it doesn't matter okay but uh, okay we uh, so so now the key point here is uh, what is the ground state so this is the kind of thing i want so these two are the same statement okay uh, so we know that uh, the the true uh, so you might uh, so that the true ground state of this theory is indeed uh, a, uh, is uh, is actually uh, has no such this thing cannot happen if this happens we would say it's thing uh, the, we would say that uh, symmetry is broken Okay. So, roughly what one has in mind is some wave function which supported this well that is the naive guess first guess and the second guess is one more here. So, there are two degenerate vacua this is what you would think, okay. but quantum mechanics you know this does not happen because there is something called tunneling. So, because of tunneling okay, you, you find that the actual true ground state is a coherent superposition of the two states which you have written in some way. Okay. So, the true ground state actually preserves the symmetry. So, the conclusion is that there is no so just based on tunneling arguments breaking of of a discrete symmetry in quantum mechanics. Okay. By the way, we can also it is useful to think of quantum mechanics as 0 plus 1 dimensional field theory. It has time, but it has a discrete number of, uh, of degrees of freedom countable or whatever. So, you just call it 0, because uh, dim if you have a, if you say 1 dimension it has 1 field worth of there are no fields in the theory. So, it is best to think of it as 0 plus 1 dimensional CFT. This is just a trivial way of stating it, but because it will connect up beautifully with everything else. Okay. So, similarly, uh, since we are saying this, this would be 0 plus 1 dimensional qu uh, quantum mechanics is nothing but 0 plus 1 dimensional quantum field theory. Okay. So, now the question is uh, let us go to let us uh, 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 raise the thing to 1 extra dimension. So, let us go to let us go to 1 plus 1. What happens in 1 plus 1?
Okay, so now we have infinite degrees of freedom, phi of x, and let's say that we chose phi of x to be equal to whatever is that wave which breaks. It's again exactly like this. So instead of the, so I just said the field because takes values say plus a or minus a. I again have a discrete z2 symmetry, okay, and the symmetry of course h it takes phi two minus phi. Okay, so this is one ground state and phi 2 of x equal to minus a is the other ground state. This is an example we have looked at in the last lecture. So, what uh, the question here is now suppose I prepare the, the system in this state, I could have done the same thing in quantum mechanics, I can, I can start with an initial configuration which uh, where the particle is uh, localized at this well, choose a wave packet which is localized there. Okay. And then, but you can show that after some time there is a finite non zero probability because of tunneling, and that shows you that uh, the I mean the, uh, uh, that the, 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 the true ground state is indeed uh, something else. Okay. So, I am doing the analog of that, I am saying let me go ahead and prepare the system in the, this first uh, uh, ground state. So, put all the field there uh, in the everything everywhere it is at A in all of space. So, now the question is can it tunnel, okay. now the point here is if it has to go to the other, uh, if it has to go to the other ground state, it, it, the, what you require is sort of spontaneously everywhere it has to tunnel and go in one fell swoop to the other thing. If it went only in some region we know that it will be like the kink or whatever. Okay. So, this sort of I am mean, not giving you a proof of anything because we are not doing quantum field theory, I just want to give you an intuitive feel of things. What this tells you is that uh, that cannot happen because you, uh, the one more thing you have to remember is that uh, the tunneling probability is actually fairly exponentially suppressed, but now given that it has to, uh, depends on the height of the potential, but it also now you have to do it everywhere in space. So, it more or less it becomes more and more unlikely and improbable. Okay. So, so the, the the point is that in any any field theory other than quantum mechanics actually discrete symmetries can be spontaneously broken okay so really tunneling as probability tending to zero so, if you discretize the thing, you will see that you require some bunch of things, but if you take the continuum limit, you are gone, you get 0. Okay. So, this, uh, this theorem was actually originally developed in the context of uh, statistical mechanical systems by Mermin and Wagner. So, it is called the Mermin Wagner theorem. And it was adapted in the context of quantum field theory by Coleman. So, let us call it the Mermin Wagner Coleman theorem. most textbooks call it the Mermin Wagner theorem. So, what it says is that uh, in, in dimensions uh, in dimension okay, no. when the dimension of space time is greater than 1 spontaneous symmetry spontaneous breakdown of symmetry okay so why uh, just one uh, uh, in the context of uh, statmax systems so, the analog of uh, dimension becoming greater, uh, space time becoming is, is like for instance the two dimensionalizing model. Uh, those of you who know that the critical temperature is at a finite value, but for the one, play, uh, one dimensional uh, the Ising chain, the, the temperature critical temperature is 0, which basically tells you that uh, there is no, there is no actually there is no phase where actually symmetry is broken, you can go up to 0. Okay. So, so, this is for uh, of discrete symmetries, but they also have something to say about continuous symmetries. 
Now, for me, it's, uh, I, I mean, we cannot use arguments like tunneling. You can see that there are subtleties because if you, if you have a continuous symmetry, I can smoothly change things. Okay, so there, so there is a little bit more uh, freedom. So the question is not. I mean, I, I, one shouldn't use these kind of hand waving arguments. Even this, I think, is hand waving. Yeah, I mean, the set, uh, setting is completely off. But uh, because we are doing classical field theory, I just wanted to give you an intuition for continuous symmetries. The statement is that you require dimensionality of space time to be greater than or uh, greater than two for continuous symmetries. So in one plus one dimensions, for instance, you cannot have a continuous symmetry. So now you can see the change here for continuous symmetries. You go from one to two. Spontaneous of symmetry of continuous symmetries is possible. It is usually written in a negative way, it says that for dimension. So, one says that the critical dimension for this is 1 or 2, this is the another way of saying. Okay. Is this clear? So, many of the considerations that we are do we are going to take a look at, you should remember that these are the issues okay. and this is worth memorizing. So, what I am going to do now is to, uh, this is all I have to say about Goldstone's theorem. The next step is to actually understand how to convert. So, we have we here, so far we have been discussing global symmetries. What will happen if you want your symmetry to become local? Okay. So, in other words, so when we let's take let's be more specific let's consider the simple example of so2 and so i think i should write from left to right not from right to left spacings get messed up i'm going to introduce some parameter which i call q become pretty soon clear what I mean. Okay. So, this is just some SO2 global symmetry with the parameter theta I have written as q times alpha okay. and alpha is supposed to be an angle and alpha is identified with alpha plus 2 pi. Okay. So, now you can and q is some integer which I will call charge. Okay. If you have just one scalar in your theory, I do not think it is a big deal what this q means. You can always say fine, I mean I live with, uh, I, I could have redefined it and defined q alpha as theta, but suppose you have the same SO2 acting on two different fields. So, I could have one field which has q equal to plus 1, I can have some other field which has q equal to 2, then there is a distinction. It means that in field space when, when one of them is rotated by 2 pi, the other is rotated by 4 pi. Okay. So, the, so, so we will call q the charge, we will see that this relates to charge in a, in a physical setting, we know that charge is quantized etcetera. Okay. So, this will map to something like that. Okay. So, right now alpha is global, is a glo so rather so we have a, what we have is we have so 2 global symmetry okay and let's assume that we have some lagrange uh, density which is a function of phi i and d mu of phi i okay such that uh, so 2 is symmetric Okay, by global I mean it is alpha is just a constant, it does not depend on space time. Okay. So, now uh, yeah, I remember I also told you sometime back that there is a way of breaking SO2 to some uh, z q or z and some discrete group. Suppose we have such a field phi 1, phi 2 such that they, uh, they pick up a wave and you have breaking of, super, uh, breaking of symmetry SO2, but now you can see that uh, 
there are rotations. Uh, so, yeah, let us assume let for, for let us assume that uh, uh, suppose we will come back to the local part. I just have a comment to make about the goals. We have a spontaneous breakdown of symmetry of SO2 by the fields by say something like this phi 1 square plus phi 2 square getting a well, we will call it A square. Okay. So, this breaks. So, you, you could start by like we did last time, we could say phi 2 equal to A, but now we can ask what is the A, what is the symmetry of uh, so, let us choose phi, so let us choose this like we did last time and ask uh, what is the symmetry of this, the, un, uh, the, the unbroken symmetry. Okay. So, obviously, the SO 1 is nothing, but you can see that uh, I can make rotations of pi. If q is 2, okay, then I can make a rotation by 2 pi over 2 which is pi such that this will still be a identity because there is a 2 in the in its transformation. More generally, if it is q, you can see that if uh, I mean it S O 2 is broken down to the subgroup z q, which is just rotations with angle 2 pi over q. Okay, so, now h is actually z q, which is rotations by Okay. So, so this I would say that this situation where G is S O 2 and H is Z Q, but of course, Goldstone's theorem will still say that there is one Goldstone boson because in terms of continuous counting this is still 0, the dimension of this continuous dimension is 0. Okay. It of course, has certain elements. Okay. So, this is, so now the, the idea is can we So, now we will can we may can we obtain a Lagrangian density that is uh, invariant under local SO2 transformation. Okay. So, what I mean by that is just go back and think of the alpha parameter as a function of space time. Okay. And let us go back to the Lagrangian density and look at it. So, you were given that this looks like something like this. U which is a function of phi 1 square plus phi 2 square. Okay. So, first step is to, so what we will do is uh, we look at first, uh, uh, so what has, so now we just go back to the same transformation and ask what happens if we uh, look at uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, the one with phi prime, but alpha now dependent on x. Okay. Easy to see that the potential energy easy to see because it does not matter, it did not really matter where it just depends on the combination phi 1 square, but what about this guy. Okay, now, it is no longer invariant and what I am going to do now is to make a slight change in, in, uh, in notation, which is to go to a complex, I will go work on a work with complex fields, which uh, rather than real just for convenience and uh, you will see. So, let us let us define phi to be phi 1 plus uh, and define phi star or phi bar as minus i phi 2. 
2 and I need to write out how this transforms and so you can see that phi prime would be phi 1 prime plus i phi 2 prime and we put things together. So, that this will be phi 1 prime is cosine phi 1 plus sin phi 2. I times okay. This may look very complicated, but actually this is nothing but okay. So phi prime just uh, so it is like going to the eigenbasis of this I am diagonalizing this matrix if you wish and so phi prime is e power i q alpha again ok and uh, <coughs> just looking at this thing we will say that phi the, the the field phi has charge plus q and the field phi bar has charge minus q okay so in in quantum field theory we will see that these are like particle anticle antiparticle yeah. so electron and positron if you, if these are fermionic these are bosonic but doesn't matter i mean what i what i mean by that is that they will have opposite charges okay and i can rewrite this lagrangian in the following fashion. Okay, so far, I have done nothing. I have just rewritten in terms of a complex basis. Okay. Now, now, you, uh, now, the thing we will see is that we will see, uh, we, uh, we will address the question whether the kinetic energy is independent, is invariant under this. Okay. So, for that what I will do is I will look at only one of these pieces, but the I could have done it in real things uh, in using phi 1 and phi 2, it is a little bit messier, okay. but uh, you do not have to feel bad about it, you can go home and work it out. Okay. So, what I want to know is what does d mu of phi prime look like. Okay. So, I mean so yeah let us do this, so d mu of phi prime will be e power i q alpha phi and alpha is also a function of x. So, now the derivative can act on two things. So, you can see if alpha were uh, alpha were uh, uh, independent of a constant this term will drop out and this is transforming nicely, it is just transforming like exactly like phi and it is not hard to see how it will be a similar to this except there will be a minus sign coming out here. Okay. So, again now you can see that this product will when alpha is independent is a constant only these two terms and there is a nice cancellation. Okay. So, the offending pieces are out here these two guys and we see that uh, it is not invariant. Okay. 
it is to be expected once you make things local, the uh, things which involve spatial derivatives should not work out, the, the cancellations which happen should not work out. Okay. And, uh, but you could take two lines uh, of thought, one would be to say fine, why I do not care about local gauge transformations, I will only work with global things and that would be the end of the discussion. But there is something very interesting which comes by saying that no, I want to make it make things invariant, I want to make it locally invariant. Okay. And uh, so, again there are many ways of doing it, but there is something called a minimal way. Okay. So, so, what we will say prescription. Okay. So, this is means that uh, it is just a way of doing it. Okay. So, minimal prescription to make Okay. So, again I do not have to prove anything, I just have to get, uh, tell you the prescription and you can go and check that it is global, I mean it is invariant under local. Okay. And the prescription is very simple, so if you have a whole bunch of fields, so you have phi and d mu of phi, the prescription is very simple, you change what you mean by derivative, you call, introduce some new derivative. Okay. So, this is some new derivative okay. and we will call it the covariant derivative okay. and the what uh, the, the condition the requirement is that so, here the guy the problem was with these derivatives, I will just postulate this, we will work out what properties we need and then I will construct that object for you. Okay. So, so this is what will happen, d mu of phi prime, I will put a prime even on top of this, you will see why, but uh, if you do not put the prime right now, I will forgive you for that. That means it transforms nicely. If if the, I mean that's what uh, that would have been our wish, but alpha here is, remains local. I'm not making it. Okay, and of course, the same covariant derivative acting on phi bar should do the same thing. Okay, now you can see that uh, if if I if my covariant derivative satisfied this condition, trivially it is invariant and life becomes good. Okay, so now we will see how how this uh, how this is done. But before that, we should uh, it's useful to go back to the days of Leibniz, where there were two people invented calculus. Uh, one of them was Newton. Who was the other? Leibniz. Okay, and most of the notation that we use today is due to Leibniz, except in physics courses. Okay, so derivatives in uh, you know I, I I use this in this course all the time, which is dot for derivatives right dot double dot triple dot so on and so forth. So, that was the notation which was used by uh, uh, Newton which was very useful because he was trying to solve problems in mechanics using by inventing calculus, but most of the notation that we use today is uh, modern notation is due to Leibniz. Okay. So, there is an important rule called the Leibniz rule and uh, is this the correct spelling E i right Leibniz. Again, there is no universality. I see a T put here. So, um, so Leibniz rule, which is a which is an important rule for derivatives, and which says the following: If you have two functions, so let's just do simple. So, this is the this is the important rule and whatever derivative we we create here that better satisfy this rule. 
this is true for one variables it is also true in multivariate calculus. So, uh, so here these derivatives are multi uh, are multi variable depend uh, d plus 1 variables. So, this is the kind of thing that you expect, okay. but uh, so this is a property. So, this will be satisfied by this rule. So, actually yeah, so let us write it this way. Okay. And the rule will be just replace these by the covariant derivatives. This rule will be satisfied by d mu as well. Okay. So, that is why it has a right to be called a derivative. This, is a, this property is called a derivation. Okay. So, the derivation property is something satisfied by this thing, but it gives up one interesting property, which is uh, however. We know that if you have smooth functions, the order of taking derivatives does not matter for smooth functions, okay. but uh, so I can rewrite this in a slightly different fa fashion. I can write it as a commutator of d mu and d nu acting on f is 0. It is just the same statement, but I just took this to the left hand side. Okay. So, so, in other words we say that the, so, so we say that normal derivatives commute okay. and the key point is covariant derivatives do not commute, do not necessarily commute, they may commute. Need not commute. So, by that we mean something like this d mu, d mu acting on some field phi may not be phi. Okay. In other words, there is an obstruction to commutativity. Okay. So, the obstruction. is actually interesting. Okay. So, I have not we will see what this obstruction is it will turn out to be something which we know okay. and we will see that this uh, way of defining things will be a uh, generalizes beautifully. Some of you have done general theory of relativity you would have seen something like this out there as well. Okay. So, what is happening is that the, co the covariant derivative does one thing for you, it makes your fields transform nicely, it removes that horrible derivative piece out there and next bit is that it, uh, uh, it satisfies the derivation rule, but does not satisfy the commutative rule. These are the things. So, let us now implement the prescription. So, what we will do is postulate the existence of a new field. field okay, and this field is a vector field. Okay. So, it is a vector valued object. Okay. That transforms under local SO2 as delta a mu okay, this is how it changes. Okay. So, by this I mean uh, okay, 
okay and they, since they are, uh, since this coordinate uh, this thing doesn't act uh, the so2 does not act on space time fields the argument is still the same so there's no worry about delta delta bar all of them are the same okay so this is just a postulate okay now you can see that this guy has just about the right uh, thing to remove something like this so i will so let me define So, this is just definition. Okay. So, there is a way to read this. Um, it says that if phi was a field which had charge q, okay, then you put it in the, so you, the charge q comes this way. Now, you can ask phi bar, what was the charge of phi bar? Minus q. So, so it acts differently. Suppose there was a field which was uh, which did not transform under this. There was charge q equal to zero. Then there was no need to. It does not transform under this thing, so there is nothing to be done. So when charge is zero, the covariant derivative reduces to your normal derivative. So it only sees fields which transform under this symmetry. Okay. So now uh, it's a trivial exercise to go back. Maybe we'll look at it next lecture is to go back and see that this is precisely this minus sign which I have put here I think it is correct. Okay. So, you can see that when I do this the delta of this object will get one extra piece which would be a d mu alpha with a minus i q d mu alpha phi which is exactly what I have here. It will cancel it. So, I have adjusted I have just chosen it in such a manner such that it transforms like this. Okay, maybe I'll do it since I have a couple of minutes. Let me just do that. So now this primes will come into play. I put a prime because a also changes. It's not like a doesn't change. So d mu prime of phi prime. Now we just look at the definition there. D mu of phi prime minus i q a mu prime phi prime. So now I have to use all these things. So, now I can go ahead and collect terms together. So, d mu acting on phi will give me e power i q alpha d mu of phi. I can combine it with this piece and I can rewrite this as. Now, what remains I have to write out one part is when the d mu acts on this. And this piece, which was left over, so these two cancel out. Okay. So you can see that uh, I have achieved what I wanted. And before I finish, I just want to point out: if you see, uh, you should see some familiar, uh, something similar to what you would have seen for the electromagnetic field, this is how it transforms under what we call gauge transformations. Okay. So, just a comment is that uh, similar to the transformation of the electromagnetic vector field, four vector field. And there are instances in which 
you can t I mean and in fact you can think of uh, electromagnetism as related to a SO2 or a U1 internal symmetry which is local. Okay. So, I am not saying this particular thing has to be there could be many many other symmetries in nature not everything has to be electromagnetism. So, but it could be thought of as electromagnetism. Okay. So, next time we will go back and look at the structure of all the terms. So, now we, we have already achieved what we set out to do which is we know what to do okay. and uh, maybe before we meet next time I recommend that you check what you get on this side. Okay. And there are uh, and Leibniz rule is very interesting. So, let us consider an object like uh, you know what should be d mu of phi square Okay. You work out these two things. So, one let us look on this phi square, what would be the charge of something which is like phi square? 2 q, right. What about an object like this phi phi bar? It is 0. Okay. So, according to this. I am just looking at the charges and saying that how did it go with the minus sign 2 i q a mu of phi square and this should be just ordinary derivative of phi phi bar. Okay. So, it is fun exercise to check that I can make Leibniz rule work and it will be compatible with these two statements. That is because the covariant derivative does depend on the charge on we of the object on which it acts very important. So, so use Leibniz rule and check that this is indeed true that is one thing and check that it does not commute and work out what this is this is fun I mean I will work it out next class, but it is going to be boring if you have not worked it out you should see something familiar. Okay. So, we will continue there next lecture we will we will work out what what these things are the obstruction to commutativity and then we will proceed from there.